morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. evening. Uh, middle of the night for some of us. Um, thank you all so very much for, for joining us again. And um, as, as Tina said yesterday, which I thought was quite clever, uh, these two gentlemen don't need any introduction because they've already been introduced. So I will pass uh, the virtual microphone um, to both Professor Slyoskin and Professor Kimmage to start today's talk, Russia and America Between Civilizations, a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, and I think Yuri, maybe we'll just dive, uh, dive right in. Uh, and I'm gonna begin with a, a few questions that I'll ask uh, Professor Slyoskin and uh, we'll offer you know, some thoughts of my own along the way. Uh, and we'll hope to occupy 45 minutes in that manner and then uh, are very eager to have a conversation with you about uh, ideas relating to the US, to Russia, US-Russian relations uh, and, to, and to civilization. And I wanted to begin, uh, Yuri, with that as the, uh, as the very first point. And I think that uh, it's fair to say at the moment that civilizational discourse or references to civilization uh, in academic and intellectual life are, are unfashionable. Uh, they're abundant in the late 19th century, going back even to the 18th century, in the early 19th century, early 20th century, think of a blockbuster book like uh, uh, Oswald Spengler's Decline of the, uh, of the West, and then even into mid-century with Toynbee and uh, other sort of best-selling historians who framed their work around the notion of civilization. Uh, and the last 20 or 30 years have shown maybe longer that this framing device, this sort of narrative device, this angle of vision uh, has become uh, unfashionable. Although you do have in the mid 1990s, the Huntington book, Clash of Civilizations and a lively conversation around that. So I wanted to begin there because it felt to me, um, and I think that this is reflected in your scholarship as well, that there's a lot to be gained from looking at civilization uh, and um, that it's still sort of fresh uh, and, and relevant and, and furthermore, quite helpful to an understanding uh, of foreign affairs at the present moment, even if it is unfashionable. So I want to sort of begin there as a first comment or, or, or question of sorts, just the status of civilization at the present moment and you know, why it's not embraced, but why it may still be significant. Well, I agree with you that it is unfashionable, but somehow present one way or another. Um, in academia, there is, I can think of one uh, field where it is not unfashionable, where it is respectable at the very least. And that is uh, Eisenstadt's work. I don't know, maybe some of you know, uh, it, all sorts of literature connected to the uh, problem of the axial age and axial age civilizations. And that is a small but very active and very vibrant field. Um, so that's, but that of course is fairly remote from Huntington's work and what we hear mostly uh, with regard to international affairs. Although again, Huntington is interesting. He's very fashionable as a straw man, right? So many texts begin with a kick uh, in his direction. Uh, so uh, it's present in that way as well. Uh, and then in political rhetoric, but you, Michael, know a lot more about this than I do. Um, in this country, the world, I mean, in, in the United States, because I'm quite far from, from you all now. Uh, but in the United States, the word civilization is rarely used. And certainly the company, and we'll talk more about this, the um, concept of Western civilization is pretty much gone. Uh, but the world is often seen in ways that Huntington would have no trouble recognizing. Uh, and they did so many, Brodel uh, and others who wrote about civilizations would, would easily recognize. Right, for a while, it like the war on terror seemed to be a kind of civilizational 
uh, struggle uh, with the word crusade used occasionally and perhaps predictably. Um, and the two main opponents most frequently mentioned are China and Russia uh, with India as an important uh, newcomer to the club of great powers. In other words, again, sort of uh, Huntington's scheme uh, seems to be alive, if not well, and uh, useful, if not always recognized. And of course, since we're talking about Russia and the US, on the Russian side, the West is the opposite number and the and the clearly understood as a civilization, but that is interesting. And perhaps we should talk about this a little later because I don't know if you have read Lavrov's recent article. Has anyone read it yet? But you know, Russia, Russia's foreign, foreign minister, Lavrov published uh, two or three days ago, published an article uh, in which he essentially juxtaposes the West to the rest of the world, which is of course a more or less constant theme in Russian political rhetoric. The interesting thing is that sometimes the West is represented as strong, vigorous, overbearing, uh, pushing its values, seeing itself as a civilization and imposing its civilizational values on others. And sometimes as a peculiar culture that has turned on itself with Russia perhaps actually there to defend whatever is left of Western civilization because in Russia you still can use that, uh, that term. So anyway, we can talk more about some of these things and obviously you have written a lot about it. I, I feel and, and we will um, you know, sort of turn very shortly to the subject of US-Russian relations, but a certain schizophrenia living in Washington DC where notions and norms of the West are very much alive. And you mentioned Lavrov's article, there's you know, regular writing from somebody like Dan Freed, I'm not sure if the name is familiar to you, but a sort of leading yeah. American diplomat and uh, expert on Eastern Europe that's extremely civilizational and makes a very stark divide between, say, Ukraine and Russia, putting Ukraine firmly in the West, you know, Kiev as a kind of city of Western liberties and Moscow as a kind of dark um, uh, Eastern civilization. So you have that that flourishes in some ways in Washington, you know, sort of dichotomies and hierarchies of civilization. Uh, and then you have American academia where that kind of thinking would be absolutely uh, anathema. So it's difficult to say what's the American voice or what's the American frame right. these sort of gradations and, and the place where the West is most robustly alive is, is Washington DC and perhaps where it's more, more robustly questioned would be, would be Berkeley, California. And that's a kind of interesting, uh, interesting uh, tension. Um, my own graduate program, uh, which was created in 1937 at Harvard, uh, in American studies, the first American studies program in American academia was called the History of American Civilization Program. Uh, and within the last 10 years, graduate students revolted against that name and had it renamed uh, American Studies, which shows not just that civilization is sort of unfashionable, but there's almost something uh, repugnant about the word uh, mm -hmm. in an academic setting. And we can try to you know, sort of understand why that might be the case uh, as we travel down the road of this um, uh, of this conversation. And, and with that in mind, uh, Yuri, I wanted to say a few words about the sort of beginning of the story uh, in the American context and then turn to ask you about uh, you know, sort of Russia and its place in, in, in sort of Christian civilizational schemes, its place in, uh, in Europe. And I think we might here return also to uh, the figure of Huntington as well. I'll mention as a footnote that for anyone interested in the Ukraine crisis, even if you think Huntington is a second rate uh, xenophobic political scientists, which many do. His chapter on Ukraine, of course, 1993, 1995, the, the book version of it, uh, is is oddly prophetic. He says the problem with Ukraine is that uh, the the sort of line of civilization cuts through the country, and that will have geopolitical uh, consequences, which is a potential reading of that uh, of that crisis. But before we get to 2014 and, and, and to more recent moments, I'll just say 
a brief word about, I think, where the American story begins when it comes to sort of civilizational self-conceptions uh, and foreign policy. And I would say that there are three pillars on which it rests, three sort of 18th century or 17th century pillars on which uh, the first chapter rests. And it's very much uh, connected to the Old Testament uh, and to a notion of the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, and other settlements, uh, British colonies as a kind of new Israel. Uh, and you see that in a lot of American place names, New Canaan, Connecticut, uh, is to be the sort of best example of the Israelites having crossed the Puritans, having crossed the, the Red, sea to, Red Sea of the Atlantic, having fleed the sort of various uh, European pharaohs and having established a New Canaan uh, in, um, uh, uh, in the Americas. Uh, and that is something that very much informs a rhetoric that still matters to American foreign policy. So from the Sermon on the Mount, the phrase city on a hill uh, is referenced by John Winthrop, the founder of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And that was a favorite phrase of, uh, of Ronald Reagan since the United States is supposed to be a beacon, a kind of um, uh, a, a place of, of, of spiritual excellence, but also of, of political excellence. And in that sense, a kind of model to the world. And this is true for many countries, but this notion of the country as a new Jerusalem, and I think that that's very much present in Russian uh, political culture as well, religious political culture, but that uh, is uh, is crucial to the 17th century uh, sort of self-conception, not quite of American citizens yet, but of, of those who will uh, go on to found uh, the Republic. Having mentioned the word Republic, the second pillar in, in the American context is clearly a connection to classical antiquity. Uh, and here there's the sense of, of, of the United States, uh, of the Republic that is founded between the 1770s and 1780s, uh, as either a new Athens or a new Rome, some sort of merger uh, of the two. And so you get Capitol Hill spelled with an O, which is meant to uh, evoke the Capitoline Hill uh, in, uh, in Rome and any number of architectural features in Washington that are supposed to suggest um, a kind of refashioning of either the Roman Republic or the Roman Empire. The Potomac River used to have a little tributary called the Tiber Creek, uh, and it just goes on without end, you know, Monticello and these, and, and, and the architecture there, University of Virginia, all of these sort of imaginings uh, of a kind of classical antiquity uh, reborn. And here you get the notion of the United States as a fulfillment of the European promise that there are all these European developments from antiquity to modern times. And the fulfillment comes uh, with the acquisition of, uh, of American liberties. And then thirdly, a kind of indigenous American uh, sensibility. And so you get on the currency, the phrase in Latin, uh, new order of the ages, uh, and something that just uh, comes, uh, uh, comes about through the American uh, newness. But here, you almost get a synthesis of the previous two pillars, it's sort of an exemplary society, a place that will um, you know, sort of show Europe and show the rest of the world what can be possible. Uh, and here, republicanism would matter a bit less than the word uh, democracy. And so um, you know, these are all civilizational schemes, or these are all pieces of civilizational schemes uh, that are powerfully present in American political culture that inform Manifest Destiny um, in the 19th century and the still very current idea of American exceptionalism robustly endorsed by Barack Obama and other uh, in the sort of recent American politicians. Uh, and you know, uh, even if these sound sort of very outmoded, sort of out of sync with contemporary American culture, you just have to look to the speeches of American politicians, including Joe Biden uh, and Donald Trump, and you'll find lots of evidence for the uh, lasting prevalence of these patterns and these schemes. So that's what I would say sort of in a nutshell about the American case. And now, Yuri, I'd like to turn to you and sort of ask about Russia's connections to these. It's actually, I would say, a similar set of ideas, really. It's interesting also that, uh, again, to maybe to get back to Huntington, uh, to remember that he is not sure whether it's the orthodox civilization or Russian civilization, whether that difference really matters. Uh, and that I think is partly due to the fact that obviously civilizations uh, can be defined in a variety of ways. And the most probably the most common definition and the one I think used by Huntington is that it's culture writ large, the largest possible cultural community short of humanity. Uh, as a whole. And that's the definition he explicitly endorses. But there is another one that I think he occasionally endorses implicitly, and that's the one 
uh, used by William McNeil in his tremendously influential book, The Rise of the West, that actually Michael, you uh, devote a few pages of your book to, uh, more than a few, in fact. And that is that uh, civilization uh, is a, the largest possible community united by shared literary canon and expectations about human behavior framed by that canon. And I think that Huntington occasionally has that definition in mind when he says, well, maybe Africa is not quite a civilization and Latin America may or may not be. And then Orthodox, not quite sure. And this is one thing that I think is very important is that while Western civilization today is, as a concept, is in exile, uh, it was, at least according to this definition, it was certainly a reality for about a thousand years in that uh, Western Christendom was a community united by a shared literary canon. Uh, and by uh, uh, an intellectual, spiritual lingo franca Latin. The Orthodox civilization, if we think about that, about it as a civilization, is not really comparable, is that it did not have a large, cohesive, supranational intellectual elite uh, that Western Christendom possessed. Uh, and of course, there was no common language, there was nothing to play the role of Latin because Greek Christian texts were early on translated uh, into um, well, originally a couple of Slavic dialects. Um, and so uh, there is sort of a problem and I think it can be uh, seen in today's political and uh, intellectual discussions in Russia, this sort of lack of self-confidence as a civilization and an uncertainty that of course has been discussed on so many occasions in so many different ways about whether the Orthodox world is comparable to Western Christendom as a civilization. And according to certain criteria, it certainly isn't. Uh, and whether after the fall of Byzantium, Russia is indeed a civilization. But then if you take some of those criteria you discussed among others by, well, by so many others, but also by Huntington, Russia doesn't seem as a large community united by shared literary canon, doesn't seem, or, or uh, did not seem up until the mid 19th century, uh, comparable, remotely comparable to some of those others that are routinely uh, mentioned as part of that list. And that is cynic or Chinese, Hindu or Indian, Japanese perhaps, um, and uh, Islamic and Western. Uh, but what I also, one other thing I, I wanted to say is that if we think of the West as at least a former civilization, a community that used to be united by a shared leader canon, which if we're talking about Christian Europe, Western Europe, consisted of two sets of texts, right? Christian texts in Latin, and then uh, the Greco-Roman canon organized fundamentally around Homer and Virgil. Uh, that certainly is not true of the Orthodox civilization. There was nothing like that. But what is interesting is that that world comes to an end, or rather begins to fade and then eventually comes to an end after the uh, 16th, 17th centuries, right? When uh, French for a while replaces Latin as the intellectual lingua, lingua franca, uh, vernacular translations of the Bible essentially dethrone Latin as the spiritual lingua franca uh, in the Protestant world. And then the English pioneer the cult of national bards by canonizing Shakespeare in the mid uh, 18th century. And then everyone follows 
and Western civilization as a cohesive civilization, according to that definition, essentially ceases to exist by the uh, turn of the 20th century when education systems are organized throughout the, the Western world and indeed moving into the Orthodox world. At that point, the distinction ceases to be meaningful, uh, organized around vernacular canons. And that's where, you know, structurally, functionally, the cult of Pushkin is not very different from the cult of Cervantes and so on. But the education systems move away from the Christian uh, and Greco-Roman curricula. And that is what to, I think is very interesting is that at that moment, the US does not follow that. At least I don't know if Michael, if you agree, but it's sort of, it seems striking that the US does not follow that, does not go down that path. It, it doesn't enthrone Longfellow or Mark Twain or whomever uh, the way all Europeans Europeans uh, did, including, you know, from Rustavelli in Georgia to Petofi in Hungary, Mitskevich in Poland, Pushkin in Russia, uh, Shevchenko in Ukraine, and so on. Um, the US keeps its political documents as centrally sacred, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. And that, and that is interesting. Maybe, Michael, you could say a few words about this apparent paradox that it is at the time when the US introduces Western civilization as part of its core college curriculum at the turn of the 20th century, that it is at that, it is at that time that it does not follow what everyone else in that Western civilization seems to be doing. In other words, there is this revolution of nationalization, national fragmentation or confession, whatever you call it, elsewhere, blurring the divide between what used to be Western and Eastern Christendom. But the US is different. Uh, and so in other words, just to, to conclude, uh, Russia is peculiar on the list of Huntington civilization because of its apparent feebleness, because of its thinness as a civilization compared to China, uh, India, Islam and so on. And, and what, after all, you know, other than the cult of Pushkin, it's not clear since it's not any different from any other such cult. It's not comparable to what we find in China and so on. Uh, and the US is also exceptional in that sense when it comes to this, this sort of civilizational uh, location. What do you think? Yes, I think that uh, uh, it is a it is a sort of startling point. Uh, it's at the turn of the century that American universities begin to create Western civilization curricula. Uh, it was almost impossible to study American literature at an American university uh, in the 19th century. It was considered to be just <laughs> not civilizationally important enough, ironically. Uh, and then you have, you know, sort of Greek and Latin as requirements for entering the world of higher education that begins to get abolished in the late 19th century. Uh, and then Sort of this notion of the West is democratized to a degree by allowing students to read um, in translation the Western canon. That's the program that Columbia begins around 1918, 1919. You have debates at Princeton at the present moment about whether classics majors are going to be required to read uh, Greek and Latin, but this was debated in a sort of sort of a different sense a hundred years ago. Uh, and then you have in the 20s and 30s an incredibly Europhilic notion of what culture was and what higher education was. It's not until the 1960s really. Uh, that um, some of that is sort of cast off uh, and uh, a, a multicultural American curriculum begins to achieve uh, a great deal more prominence. I happen to have been in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. yesterday. It is a remarkable National Gallery in the sense that three quarters of the art in the old wing of the National Gallery is not American, it's all European. So what kind of nation is that that has three quarters of its art that's imported from some other place? But it's a very telling uh, detail and I think goes to the heart of what you're uh, describing. So the orientation toward the West and still toward the classical world to a great extent is really quite uh, profound in the first half of the 20th century. And if I, Michael, if I of may course. just insert one thing, it's interesting because I was just a few days ago at the National Gallery in Latvia here in Riga, where I am right now, and it's obviously the opposite. Uh, it's a completely different story, the exact opposite, in that there's nothing but Latvian art and preferably by ethnic Latvian painters. And so we, what at least Lavrov and others call the West 
includes some very different cultural civilizational arrangements, right? From a mono-ethnic state with its history and history of its art uh, depicted accordingly in places like Latvia, Estonia, Poland, Hungary, and so on. And then there is Western Europe, but we'll talk later about it, uh, where that sort of bard-centered, vernacular canon-centered culture is in the decline. And then there is the US with its own peculiar story. Yes, I think some of what you mentioned before about the self-confidence uh, in itself as a situation is, uh, is, although different in valence, as much an American phenomenon as it is a, uh, a Russian phenomenon. Let's think of the last paragraph of Tocqueville's Democracy in America from the 1830s, where he predicts that these two kind of massive but sort of uncivilized powers at the periphery of Europe are going to dominate the, uh, the 20th century. That's a French view, but you can sort of feel that within uh, the US and Russia as well. Yuri, I was hoping now to turn to the early Cold War. It's to fast forward quite a bit, although we spoke just a moment ago about the first half of the 20th century. Let me just offer a few thoughts about the US as a sort of foreign policy civilization in the 1940s and 50s, and then um, mm -hmm. You know, we can turn our attention to the Soviet Union. So you already mentioned a moment ago a very remarkable book published in 1963 by the University of Chicago historian William McNeil, which was, you know, assigned for decades and, uh, you know, sort of a great academic blockbuster uh, of its time, National Book Award winner uh, and very, very celebrated uh, book. And this uh, tells the story that was, uh, in a sense, being told in American foreign policy as well at the time, which was... Uh, Greek liberties um, adopted by Rome and then uh, informing many different patterns within European history brought in effect to the American colonies by the, by the British uh, and then um, uh, absorbed into a, a American political system uh, and brought to a very high level of cultural civilizational achievement by the middle of the, uh, of the 20th century. Interestingly, McNeil's book, this is just a footnote, is, is uh, doesn't accept fully the dichotomies of the Cold War. So it's not, doesn't exclude the Soviet Union from the story or doesn't exclude Russia from the story. Um, and it's not a sort of either or book, but it is very much as you gather from its title, The Rise of the West, it's very much a celebration uh, of, of Western liberties. And you see that across uh, American foreign policy thinking of the 1940s uh, and 50s, whether it's Dean Acheson or George Kennan uh, or uh, or others, there's a very strong sense that uh, the reconstitution of Europe after 1945, the construction of the NATO alliance, the Marshall Plan, the sort of main lines of American Cold War foreign policy were all not just military and economic in nature, but also civilizational. It was sort of the task of the United States. This is how this generation of foreign policy makers understood their position. It was their task both to restore and to defend uh, Western civilization. You'll see this language all through uh, Truman's speeches, Truman who never went to college but was enamored of the notion uh, of Western civilization. You see it uh, more than you would expect in Eisenhower's speeches. The sort of gray, dull, drab rhetoric of Eisenhower is very often civilizational uh, in, uh, in nature. He writes a letter to American soldiers during the Second World War and says, you cannot destroy, to officers and soldiers, you cannot destroy any cultural landmark speaking specifically of France and Germany, because that's what this war is about. It's about the preservation of these civilizational structures, institutions, uh, and legacies. And that's Eisenhower, who's the least romantic or poetic of American presidents, but that was his uh, purview. And then certainly Kennedy uh, as well, whose speech in West Berlin, 1963, summer of 1963, comes out the same year as McNeil's book. Uh, and not only does he say, ich bin ein Berliner, that's the phrase that he's famous for, but also in that speech in West Berlin, he says, Simos Romano Sum, using the Latin words to say that he's a sort of citizen uh, of the newfound Roman Empire, which is the transatlantic relationship by 1963. And I think he's sort of welcoming Germany back into the club of civilized nations with that Latin phrase uh, in, in West Berlin. So the bonds of the alliance are civilizational, and in some ways, the goals of the transatlantic alliance in these years. Uh, our civilization, and there was no ambiguity about what that civilization was, it was the civilization uh, of the West. So I think that that's a fair generalization, perhaps, of American foreign policy from 1945 to 1963, and it would be very interesting to turn our gaze in those years to the Soviet Union, which is, of course, competing over the same uh, 
uh, you know, sort of territories and for the allegiance of, of the same countries in, in, in these years? Uh, I would add one thing to your description, or at least propose one thing in connection to your description of sort of U U US civilizational claims during the Cold War. And that is, I think, the presence of a tension between the West and the free world, between the sort of cultural and global. Uh, on the one hand, the US led and represented a particular civilizational, cultural, political tradition. On the other, it led and at least uh, considered representing the entire world minus uh, the Soviet Union and its uh, satellites. And that did create, I think, some tension that led to the uh, collapse of the, or at least the decline of the free world. And we'll talk about the decline of the sort of West uh, centered rhetoric, but also of the free world centered rhetoric in the I guess by the early 70s or, or so, especially with the rise of the third world that claimed to owe allegiance to neither. Uh, but on the Soviet side, again, we see perhaps a stronger tension, but two and maybe even three components. One obviously is the Russian one that is reborn in the early to mid 1930s. Uh, growing considerably during the war uh, and then rising, if not to the top, but right and looming very large in the early um, Cold War uh, years and the various Russian civilizational claims. And then of course there is Marxism, Marxism, Leninism, uh, which one could I suppose also call a civilization, right? In the sense that it was a large community like, you know, Islam a very large community united by a common, let it be recent, but still uh, uh, united by a literary uh, canon or by a set of sacred texts, one could say essentially the same thing. Uh, but it proved, and I think it was felt fairly early on already in the Soviet Union to be a fairly thin civilization. In the Soviet Union, already in the early 1930s, Marxism lost out uh, resoundingly to the Russian vernacular canon of the 19th century as the center of the education system. It's something I think that's very important and rarely remarked upon, that all, from the early 1930s and, and all through the Soviet period, and of course into our world today, uh, the Russian or Soviet Russian education system was, organ was organized around uh, the Russian literary canon, with no one really reading Marx or Lenin in, in school. So that it was a civilization, it was official, it was subscribed to, it was invoked on so many different occasions. It was used to legitimize the regime. And I think that's one reason for its eventual collapse uh, is its very poor rootedness compared to this case in China, for example, where it was nationalized early on. Uh, but anyway, so the Soviet Union to some degree represented Russia, more so at least for external consumption representing Marxism, Leninism, uh, with interestingly enough, whereas in on the Western side or on the US side, freedom and free Europe, free, you know, radio liberty, whatever it is, free enterprise, everything was one way or another about freedom and liberty. In the Soviet Union positioned itself mostly as the champion of peace, right? Already starting in certainly, I think in the early 50, you are a much bigger expert on this than I am, but my it certainly was big in the 60s and 70s, was the main sort of uh, proclaimed goal of Soviet foreign policy was peace, struggle for peace. 
uh, no, not really with you know freedom in the Marxist sense uh, was pretty much gone, um, which had been so prominent in the 1920s. And liberation was reserved primarily for nationally defined units, uh, national liberation. Um, and so there were, one could say that in civilizational terms, there were two sets of texts, sets of goals, sets of claims. Uh, and both of them were self-contradictory and uncertain and changing over time. And then I would add just one thing that the two had in common and certainly toward the end, especially of World War II, on the Soviet side, claims were made that the Soviet army was there to protect our common civilization from barbarism. Uh, and that was at least one context in which it was argued very vehemently, and I think ultimately very successfully, that the Soviet Great Patriotic War was not against Germans as a nation, but against a particular ideological plague. Uh, so just to conclude, I think that the sort of US claims were a little less schizophrenic, but that both were, uh, were not entirely unitary and not entirely consistent and sometimes wildly inconsistent. Two very brief responses before moving on to more recent uh, moments. One about uh, um, uh, barbarism uh, and the other about the, the, the free world. I'll start with the free world. I think that um, there is a, a sort of period of, of almost utopian optimism in the 1950s about what the US could accomplish, when, accomplish through development and uh, sort of through the Cold War. Um, in the third world and that just uh, crashed into the reef of the Vietnam War uh, and decolonization in general, which was very, very difficult for the US to deal with uh, during the Cold War. And it so often came out on the wrong side of various post-colonial uh, conflicts. And so it sort of almost retreated back into the West. And then of course you had the revival of uh, dissident movements in Eastern Europe in the 1980s and the sort of 1989, the collapse of communism in Europe, and that became the thing that was celebrated. But the more you look into the sort of third world or, or post-colonial non-aligned dimensions of the Cold War, the more you see, you know, sort of uh, policy failures and, and, and policy confusion in the US. And so that, I think, notion of the free world never, um, you know, sort of succeeded uh, uh, in those terms. And then in, just in terms of barbarism, it's so interesting what you say, Yuri, about uh, the Second World War as a war against barbarism. I just was struck by a quote from, uh, uh, Avril Harriman, who was uh, U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union and you know, sort of close confidant of many presidents, uh, and he said that the worst thing about the Second World War is that it's brought barbarism, it's opened the gates of Europe to barbarism, by which he meant Asia, by which he meant the Soviet Union, by which he meant yeah. Russia, sort of so the steps of, of Asia have been uh, opened and, 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 and European civilization has been, uh, in a sense, invaded, which to me is just such a peculiar reading of the Second World War, but, uh, you know, was perhaps not so uncommon in the 1940s, so you get conflicting notions of barbarism, which must, must, must speak the conflicting notions of civilization. Mm -hmm. Those two terms are, of course, always paired one with the other. Um, let's go for purposes of time. I was hoping to go sort of through the 1990s and the collapse of the Soviet Union to that decade, and perhaps we can make reference to that, or if, or if students have questions about that period, we can return to it. But for purposes of time, let's jump all the way up to 2014. Um, and the sort of impasse that you see in 2014, which I'm convinced uh, is an impasse, not just of foreign policy, but uh, also of some cultural imagination uh, and, uh, and cultural language. And I'll just generalize very briefly about Russia, although you know, with, without really sufficient knowledge in this respect, but a sort of Kremlin perception of the US hunger for primacy. Uh, and you were mentioning Lavrov's article, The Sense of the West as a vigorous, strong element that imposes itself uh, either on Russia or its neighbors, or alternately, and this could be a, same, a similar version of the, of, of the same argument, uh, that by 
westernizing Ukraine, what, what the United States is doing is, is sort of fundamentally uh, trying to weaken Russia, playing the borderlands off of Russia in a very old game uh, of politics and civilization. And that, you know, if, if truly held by Russian policymakers, Putin and other policymakers, uh, leads uh, to conflict. And then you have another justification for conflict on the side of the United States, where you have the Washington DC perception that Russia is promoting a Russian world, uh, that it's using the dark arts of its propaganda and sort of media apparatus, uh, espionage apparatus to impose its civilization uh, on sort of border populations that don't want it. You often hear the argument in Washington that Putin seeks to reconstitute the Soviet Union, sort of bring about this uh, old structure um, and, uh, you know, sort of a neo-Soviet reading of, uh, of uh, of Russian foreign policy, uh, which too, if, if it's a correct assessment of, of sort of Russian intents, would, would really lead to a very conflictual approach. And so I guess my generalization is that you sort of have civilizational incentives on both sides since 2014 uh, to engage in conflict. And I would be very curious, Woody, to get your thoughts on, it's not the typical reading of 2014 to the present, but I think it's a possible one. Um, well, I think there is a, I'm not sure that, uh, again, this is, you know more about this and there you all are in the United States right now, but I'm not sure that Russia is described in uh, American political rhetoric in the media and so on as a civilization, unlike China. And its goals as somehow civilization, there's a huge difference, I think, between the Cold War clash as represented on both sides and certainly as seen from the United States, where they were dealing with evil, however, however described, right? Uh, the world of slavery or the evil empire, whatever. But with a world that did see itself as different that did describe itself as oppositional, as self-sufficient, um, as expanding, if not necessarily expansionist. Um, today, it's not, I mean, Russia is usually described as just the way sometimes the, uh, servants of Satan are described in Christian literature, that basically they're just after mischief. They are there to do, to cause mischief and to undermine democracy. And at this point, democracy is, I guess, the central concept in, in the way uh, the West is represented. Uh, not so much freedom anymore, although it's there, but democracy, I think, as a concept is used a lot more often. But anyway, Russia is represented mostly as Putin and Putin's goal is even if it's described as one of empire building, it's not clear on what basis, right? There were used during the Cold War, there were debates, yeah, is the Soviet Union, is it expanding because of its ideology, which is communist ideology, which is uh, inherently expansionist or because of the Russian imperial something or other. Now it's not clear to me what, I mean, and again, you know, you know better how to uh, describe various approaches, but I don't really see, see Russia as, you know, from the, uh, as represented in the United States as a civilization with its values. And they may be awful values, but still, uh, you know, China may be seen as a civilization inferior to the Western one because it's not committed to the individual and individual rights and so on. And here I would, by the way, I would add one other thing. And this, where I think that this, uh, the contradictory nature of Western self-representation has grown since the end of the Cold War. And that is that as the as Western civilization as a concept is has declined, so human rights as a global ideology has risen, uh, and so we have the situation where Lavrov talks about the West as a civilization as well as a military alliance, uh, and the West talks less about itself and its values and history and more about 
uh, global human values, human rights in particular, rooted in human nature, not in its own history. So there are, I think there are kind of difficulties on both sides, but I think in Russia, at least in Russian political circles, the West is represented as a, as a much more meaningful entity than Russia is in the West. I think that that's very fair. At the only possible exception I could see to that would be in sort of policy conversations about the Russian Orthodox Church uh, and its, its, its malign influence. I mean, it's folded into the sort of mischief making of, uh, of the mm -hmm. Kremlin for the most part, that's the basic thrust of the analysis, but there's a certain civilizational concern that it will contribute in the Balkans and elsewhere to sort of uh, negative political tendencies and that for, um, for civilizational re reasons, sort of civilization as a smokescreen for the true interests of, uh, of the Kremlin. But I think you're right, that it's not idea driven, that it's Putin driven. Uh, sort of personality driven, or this is the word that you very often hear, regime driven. So it's not a civilization, it's a regime. And that's the, um, you know, that's the, uh, that's the thing that, uh, that really matters. I want, before asking my sort of final question to address a, what I see as sort of intersecting irony at the present moment, given the conflict between the US uh, and, and, and Russia, and it has very much to do with uh, with civilization. And I think that Putin has closely associated, associated Russian civilization, I would assume that Lavrov does the same in his text, with state power. Uh, but it's unclear to me how, how much this top-down project generates true popular support. I think we heard from Dmitry Trenin yesterday about the sort of fragmented notion of Russian political so society at the present moment, more critical than I would have expected him. Uh, to be, and then we also heard from Vodolaskin, who says that the higher values in life don't come from politics, they come from literature. And you shouldn't even look in a way to politics for these sort of higher values of life. I don't think by that he was criticizing uh, Putin, but he was sort of disassociating the political world from uh, the cultural world. So I'm not sure how much genuine civilizational energy there really is uh, that's sort of in the name of the Russian state at the present moment. I think there's some, uh, but I'm not sure how much it really sort of speaks to younger, uh, more creative uh, Russians. And of course, there's a great precedent for that, both in Soviet and Imperial Russian history, where the cre creative energy just sort of seems to exist in some tension, uh, from Pushkin forward, uh, in some tension with uh, the sort of official uh, and state-driven uh, sense of, of what Russian society uh, is about and what Russian culture should be. So if that tension is there, um, uh, I think it's sort of mirrored in some ways in an American situation uh, where um, uh, although from the outside world, there are countries that very much worry about the assertiveness of the West, many countries, um, but the term of art, the West has really faded away almost entirely uh, from respectable uh, American intellectual life. And to me, the most vivid example of this at the moment, it's not quite about the West, but it's sort of this, this irony that, that strikes me uh, is that you have a Biden administration that's robustly, robustly Wilsonian in its foreign policy, right? A world of autocracies and democracies and we need to be, you know, sort of American leadership and, uh, you know, as was Obama, as was Reagan, as were many presidents after Wilson, a sort of strong, strong embrace uh, of these Wilsonian concepts. But at the same time in Washington, D.C., there's a strong movement that I think will soon succeed to rename Woodrow Wilson High School uh, after someone else because Woodrow Wilson is associated with segregation and, uh, you know, sort of his conviction uh, convictions and views. And um, these are two separate things, but it's at the very least an irony that Wilson would be sort of the main figure still uh, in American foreign policy as it conceives himself, but he's so controversial now as a historical figure uh, that his name has been removed from the Princeton School and I'm sure will so soon be removed uh, from the school in, uh, in Washington, D.C. So there seems to be a kind of tension also or a, a, a stark divide almost between the official policies of the United States, the official foreign policy, uh, and the sort of true direction of, uh, of American culture. But I wanted to ask you about this tension, Yuri, as you see it between sort of the projection of, 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 of this and sort of power politics, but then this very complicated reality uh, on the ground, uh, sort of wrestling with civilizational notions by uh, the people of Russia and of the United States. Uh, well, I, I think that both are in trouble. Uh, that I agree with your description of the situation in Russia, I would add, to, I mean, the way I think 
Putin and others describe uh, what Russia stands for today uh, is indeed connected to the history, strength, uh, health of the Russian state, but also some sort of vague references to tradition, including orthodoxy, culture, family, and so on. Uh, things that they claim are in trouble in the, in the West. But of course, what is interesting and I think crucially important is that a very large uh, contingent within the Russian intellectual elite, uh, probably the, the majority of its members, are pro-Western and do not share Putin's agenda. Uh, and indeed identify with the West and the West's policy with regard to Russia. Uh, it's interesting that Lavrov in his letter uh, said that these people, people that the West counts on are a tiny, tiny negligible minority in Russia. And I think that this is maybe numerically true, but to see that group as negligible is a terrible mistake uh, at best. Um, because we say what the same one could say about the Russian uh, intellectual elite, otherwise known as the intelligentsia in the late imperial uh, Russia, and then in the Soviet Union. Um, and I think the regime's refusal to, to attempt to incorporate that group uh, politically is maybe suicidal. Although whether they are, you know, can be incorporated is another, is another, is another question. But it's interesting that all attempts to that, uh, efforts to that effect seem, seem to have been abandoned. So there is, I think, potentially a, uh, a very dangerous um, cleavage there. And then on the US side, and we have referred to this, indeed on the Western side in general, again, if we are, if, if this conversation is devoted to the concept of civilization and civilizational uh, competition and so on, then what is clear is that the, what used to be the West, a community united by a common literary canon is no longer, right? The West does not have a common literary canon anymore. The Christian one is pretty much, is mostly gone from education systems and the, even political uh, speeches for the most part. The Greco-Roman one that used to be so important for elite training, I guess most recently in the UK, is also on its way out. But what is interesting is that the vernacular canons that replace them are also in decline and in trouble in Western Europe, not certainly not in Eastern Europe or in Russia. Um, but in Western Europe, the place of you know, Goethe and Shakespeare uh, is not what it used to be 50 years ago. And of course, in the United States, the sacrality of the of the founding fathers and declaration of independence and constitution is in trouble. And so I would I agree with with what you said about the sort of Wilsonian uh, paradox, but I think it goes much farther. I think, uh, in other words, I am not sure. <laughs> sure, nobody knows, of course, what will happen. But this is truly a revolution. I think that's happening. When we were talking about the, if indeed Western Christendom was replaced by, on the one hand, national cultures organized around vernacular canons, on the one hand, and this, if you will, messianic uh, entity, the United States, that claimed to kind of stand for the West as a whole, and at the same time, but was not organized in, along the same national lines, both are being questioned, both principles. And so the West persists as a, the world's most powerful empire, if you will, most powerful military alliance, 
financial uh, entity, um, informational, and so on and so forth. But it seems to be kind of hollow in the middle in some very important sense. And I think that your book points to it, except that since your book came out, things have gotten more dire. And I'm not here you know, in my Cassandra role, just trying to describe what I see within that particular framework of civilizational analysis. Well, this takes me to my final question, which, which goes in a, in a somewhat different direction and we'll, we'll turn the floor over to, to, to you, the students. And I wanted to ask finally about bridges because there seem to be so many between Russia and the United States. And it's as interesting as the recurrent conflicts between these two countries or these two powers um, is a sort of recurring cultural or civilizational connection. So I think of Alexander Harrison, who names his magazine The Bell after the Liberty Bell in, in, in Philadelphia. Um, you know, even Tolstoy had, you know, sort of low key but interesting preoccupations with figures like Thoreau uh, and others from American life, Soviet dissidents who turned to the United States, uh, not just for a kind of material support as they did in some cases, but uh, uh, to understand the norms and sort of uh, values that they were agitating for. Uh, and, you know, I think where we would find this maybe most vibrant at the moment would be uh, in journalism. And you have all of these sort of opposition, independent, critical journalists, some of them living in Latvia, Lithuania, uh, or, or, or in the United States. Uh, and I think there, there's a kind of inspiration that's drawn from the, the, the tradition of, of, of a free press in the United States and uh, you know, sort of political pluralism and political uh, back and forth. And so we can look at this sort of interesting set of, of, of connections that runs through Russian culture from the 19th century to the present and, and draws upon certain American precedents. And likewise, in the US, you have uh, the enormous prestige of Russian literature. Um, which um, you know, maybe it's not quite what it was in the decades immediately after the Second World War when you have these booming uh, Russian literature programs, but is still you know, sort of prominent. Uh, you know, the ways in which writers like Dostoevsky are fundamental to the development of Ralph Ellison and, uh, and, and many other American uh, writers, that list sort of goes uh, on and on. Uh, you have the diaspora populations, Russian diaspora populations in the United States, which are you know, sort of the culture and life of the US is unthinkable without these, um, without these figures from, you know, sort of Nabokov to Joseph Brodsky to many, many others in the worlds of business and, uh, and, and, and politics as well. Uh, but you also have figures like John Reed and Donald Trump who look admiring to, admiringly uh, to Russian politics, um, and sort of see something of, of, of value there. We can sort of dismiss that aspect of Trump as, as sort of a monstrous element of his political worldview, but in many ways, it's just more interesting uh, than not that he spoke so admiringly uh, of, uh, of Russia and of course on the American left going back to you know, sort of early Soviet times, there's a huge amount of admiration uh, and connection. You can think of a life like Paul Robeson's life, right? Where he you know, sort of turned to, to Russia and it was Russia in this case, as well as the Soviet Union uh, for a certain kind of, of inspiration. So I wanted to ask you, Yuri, about the bridge crossers uh, and the people who have gone sort of across civilizational lines uh, and felt like they profited from uh, an admiration when you know, maybe in, in the official political world, there was more of an effort to, to build borders um, in the cultural and, and sort of imaginative world, uh, you just as often see, uh, see bridges. Well, I think obviously there are all kinds of connections, but I would emphasize the asymmetry because I think it wouldn't be entirely fair to talk about these two competitors or two entities uh, uh, clashing or facing each other uh, and then a bridge connecting them with some sort of pedestrian traffic in both directions. I think the asymmetry is striking. Like the United States is the center of a global empire. Its charisma is enormous. My, a large portion of the Russian elite is passionately in love with it. The Americans who were in love with the Soviet Union were mostly interested in communism. Sometimes Russia, and you know, more or less you couldn't easily divide the two, but Russia was and could be part of the package, but it was essentially the Soviet, the Soviet uh, uh, Union. 
and the dream of communism and the certain universalist ideology that the Soviet Union uh, represented. I think that's true of both John Reed and Paul Robeson and so many, so many others. Um, and indeed, for a while, it, that attraction was important enough uh, to make Senator McCarthy possible. Uh, but in today's world, what is Russia's charisma and attraction to the United States? It's non-existent. It's not, I mean, the literature is, I think, is exceedingly marginal in the marginal presence in American life. I remember at least in the 90s, you know, be your basic coverage of Russia in US media, and there would be some political reports, but there would also be all sorts of sometimes very cheesy stories about church bells or about some quaint community in Siberia or about some, some writer uh, now it's very rare. I mean, the image is almost almost uh, entirely negative, politically so. Uh, and, and again, it's just a matter of a scale and b the but. And here I would add one thing that strikes me as very interesting. Given the enormous asymmetry, right? Russia may be dismissed as Obama did as a regional power or even as a gas station uh, with an army or whatever the, the expression was, or it can be represented as ubiquitous uh, source of evil around the world. Uh, but one way or another, it is not comparable to the United States in so many ways. Uh, and its presence in America, I think is, 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 is negligible. Uh, other than a source of political threat. Uh, and, you know, who would, how, who would follow Trump in his admiration for Putin? In any way, we can talk more about this because there are certainly people around the world and especially in Western Europe, if you take Uber in France or in Amsterdam, most drivers, when you know, ask me where I'm from, and they hear I'm from Russia, tell me go Putin. But that's a different, that's a different uh, question. But what I was going to say that, given that enormous asymmetry, um, the West and the United States, in particular, does not seem anywhere near as self-confident politically and culturally as it did in the 1970s during the late Cold War period. Uh, back then, everyone assumed, or let's say both sides assumed that any student exchange might result in some Soviets wanting to stay in the United States. Any informational exchange might result or should result or will result in Soviets hearing the word of truth and who in America ever we ever bothered with Radio Moscow. Uh, it was kind of a more or less noticeable, I think, presence in parts of the so-called third world, but certainly not in the West uh, by the 1970s. And so one side jammed the voice of America and the Deutsche Welle and the rest of them, and the other didn't worry about it at all. And now, Given the asymmetry, they do this endless talk about Russian propaganda, fake news, all this stuff. I'm in Latvia today, RT is banned. I cannot, I used to begin my day by looking at the lowest common denominator around the world. CNN, Fox News, the BBC, Al Jazeera, and RT, just to see what the, you know, the clowns are saying. In Latvia, I cannot see the Russian official point of view unless I just look at the Russian channel. But I was curious about the way they sell themselves or I, you know, sell themselves to the, to the West in English, which is interesting. But you could not do it in Latvia. It says it's unsafe. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, they also banned most Russian TV stations and radio stations and so on. But that's not just true of Latvia. This talk is everywhere, and it's somehow terribly dangerous to hear from them. And again, given the asymmetry of, of power, economic, financial, you know, you can't sanction the United States. It can only be done in, in the opposite direction. 
it's very interesting to me. And I was curious how you would explain this, the disappearance of this remarkable self-confidence that the West had back in the late Cold War period. I don't know if I, if I do have an explanation for it. Certainly, if you would look at the discourse now about decline, um, you know, it's every third op-ed in the New York Times is about the possible decline of democracy. Um, you know, that seems like a very reasonable subject to be debating uh, at the present moment. That I think is not so much geopolitical, that's, you know, uh, internal uh, to the United States. But what's more striking and um, uh, would simply be worth uh, very careful consideration and study is the lack of cultural confidence, sort of broadly speaking, uh, although not of the people who run American foreign policy. For the most part, I mean, they still seem. Um, although you're right, these sort of anxieties are mounting, uh, but um, they still seem to speak a language that's almost 20, 30, uh, 30 years old. I think that what has come home to the United States after 2008, in particular with the financial crisis, and then a series of foreign policy setbacks, starting with Ukraine, but also uh, in the Middle East, you have the withdrawal of Afghanistan from Afghanistan as we speak, which is reminiscent a little bit of the fall of Saigon. Uh, in 19, 1975, uh, the sort of Western model is, globally speaking, quite a bit weaker uh, than it used to be. It's less attractive, it's less influential, it's less able to sort of get results. Uh, and I think that was the very grudging realization of the Obama administration. They began with these great hopes about, you know, sort of bringing the Western model to the, to the world at large. Um, certainly Bill Clinton had those hopes, and I think they ended sort of clutching uh, the relationship with Angela Merkel and sort of hoping that, that would uh, that would sort of stay up and running because everything else seemed to be crumbling and falling apart uh, around them. So I think it's a complicated intersection of internal cultural ferment uh, and chaos up to a point, uh, and then uh, a, geo a geopolitical situation where the U.S. is just less able to get the results it wants, and that induces, I think, a kind of fear. And so you worry about RT in that context. Uh, you know, in ways that uh, would have been unthinkable, exactly as you point out, uh, in the 1970s. But perhaps we turn to our students now, uh, and uh, just going to make one final point about the decline of Russian studies. It's conforms to exactly what you were saying, Yuri, a sort of decreasing influence, decreasing interest in Russian language, uh, you know, sort of fewer uh, American students who are studying uh, Russian history, Russian literature. That would suggest a kind of uh, you know, sort of profound lack of interest, which you do feel in the sort of broader broader media culture as well. But since the students are such robust exceptions to that trend that we have with us, uh, let's let's turn the floor over to them and see what uh, what their concerns are. <laughs> 